The Diary of a Harlequin is proudly brought to you by Charles Stanley Wealth Managers, official player welfare partner of Harlequins. If you're looking to start your investment journey, then Charles Stanley has lots of tips and ideas on how to secure your financial future. Welcome to the Diary of a Harlequin. I'm your host, uh, Joe Yates Round, and today we'll be talking to Lewis Liner about what it takes and what it means to be a Harlequin. Lewis has a surname many of you will recognise, but what you may not know is he was born out in Italy and didn't move to the UK until he was four. Eligible for England, Australia and Italy at test level, he's been a part of the England setup in recent years. Part of the Quinns Academy since the age of 13 and score of one, if not two, of the most important tries in Harlequin's recent history at that final in 2021 against Exeter. When not on the pitch, Lewis loves gaming, saying in a recent interview that he thinks that gaming has contributed to his lightning fast reactions. Welcome, Lewis. Oh, thank you for having me, Joe. It's been it's nice to be talking to you again. Always, always a pleasure. So talk to me about, about gaming then, mm-hmm. first up. I've read that in an interview that you said yes. that that's part of your actions. You've been uh, out injured for a while. Is that what you've been doing, just COD, for <laughs> eight months? I wish. No, it's, uh, I, as much as I love gaming, it's a good way to um, pass the time, relax a bit, and play with friends I may have not seen for months. But um, other than that, I've been starting university. I'm, I'm doing economics at... Uh, so Surrey University, so where we train effectively, so it's very convenient. Um, at first, I was I panicked a bit when I started that course because I hadn't done education in four years. So yeah. I was just like, how do I write something? <laughs> or like, how do I? Well, like the things were coming thick and fast. I didn't even do A level maths, and everyone knows you. It's said that you need A level maths or economics. So I've been doing okay. I've been uh, learning the so, way. So you're doing economics degree but without a level maths mm-hmm. how much are you having to like a lot a lot yeah, yeah it's been some dark days so with the maths i've <laughs> my mum who did economics as well um in italy i showed her some of the stuff i did and she was like yeah i can't help you sorry <laughs> <laughs> that's always <laughs> encouraging no it's always encouraging when you have that help but um no it's been really insightful and it's actually been really cool to be able to do my rehab because obviously i've been injured for the last seven or eight months um be able to work hard at Quinn's, do my rehab, come home, watch a lecture or two, understand things I didn't think I'd ever understand being at school. Yeah. And when it's actually really rewarding, like learning a, a maths concept, I wouldn't even, bat- I would, I would have looked at and been like, nah, can't do it. And have it learning is it. actually one of the most rewarding feelings and uh, doing that. And then um, seeing my girlfriend or playing COD with the boys. So that's a, uh, might basically be my seven months really it's been it's been busy then by the time <laughs> oh, yeah it's actually i've been keeping myself busy yeah so why economics um i don't know i think it's it's like the classic it's got so many opportunities for, for a graduate or for when i finish rugby hopefully after a successful career um that's uh that um i can get i can have all these opportunities not maybe through maybe through people i've met during my rugby career there'll be paths to follow there um and I also, my dad um, likes economics and he ha- plays a, played a role in that. And I just find it really interesting how the macroeconomic part where one thing that happens over here in a different country can affect oil prices and how much, how expensive petrol is here in the UK. And we all know that's been annoying to deal with the last yeah. several months. Um, and then also the micro details um, or how companies work and all the production and yeah, and also the maths, that's, that's been tough, but it's, it's also been really good. Well, I don't know who on their um, Diary of a Harlequin bingo sheets had uh, oil price issues within the first five minutes of today's <laughs> well, episode, yeah, but, but it's out of my wheelhouse, so I think we'll leave that to, uh, to brighter and better people to pick <laughs> up. Um, teen, but let's address it at the top with that liner surname. Mm. Like, how much, particularly in those early years, from other parents, from coaches, even from teammates, was... Was Michael Liner's son? Was that a thing, yeah. or did you kind of know it was always going to happen? So didn't really. Listen uh, to it? Yeah, so it was it. It was a thing. I mean, I before Quinn's Academy at thirteen, I started playing rugby when I was four or five at mm-hmm. Richmond. When I came over from Italy, we started playing there on Sunday mornings. Thanks to my um, my parents t- took me to everything. So <laughs> they were they were um, no, they were really kind. And no, it's you're you're right. It ha- it did happen quite a lot when I was younger. I didn't really notice it because obviously I was just playing rugby I didn't really care uh, about anything else um but it was more when I you say I got I went into secondary school 
and I started playing loads of other schools and people getting older and really like actually enjoying rugby and parents it was more the parents yeah. knowing my dad would tell their sons oh that's so and so's son or I could hear on the sidelines something and my dad said to me sometimes he could hear on the sideline because he's very if you've ever been to a game uh, not here at Harlequins, but one of my old school games, you'd, you'd probably very, find it very hard to find my dad. He'd always wear a cap and sunglasses, no matter right. the weather, and be out of sight. But um, no, it's a, and even when I got older, it didn't really bother me. It's, um, mm. it's just something I took in my stride. And it, yeah, it's sometimes playing the back of my head where uh, people ex- expected me to get, catch the ball and run not the length of the field every single time. And when it didn't happen, people were like, oh, he's not that good. So... Uh, it's, uh, that has happened. And, That's interesting. Uh, so did you find the, the burden of expectation mm. initially was maybe harder, that you'd be like, oh, people are expecting me to pick the ball up, beat every player on the pitch and score a try, whereas actually just doing the basics at that age. Well, exactly. What That's, what, That's what my dad kind of installed into me from a young age, and I even do it now when I'm playing out for Harlequins, is I just sh- there's no point thinking about scoring length of the field tries or doing flash stuff to keep if you can't catch and pass or yeah. like I've always said I've, I've pr- I prefer to assist someone than actually score the try because then that means you actually you do the work for the try and someone else finishes it off so that's why like uh, that I I get all the credit for scoring tries mm-hmm. but you don't people look at what Marcus do and mm-hmm. and stuff like that and he, he just works wonders and that's what I would rather do than just get a walk in effectively but um no, it's uh, it's interesting, as you say. The older I got, the more I was just like, you know what, I'm just going to play rugby. And if I'm good enough, people won't start calling me. People will start calling me by my name, not just his son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And soon he'll just be Lewis Liner's dad. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, he's actually had that a few times. Has he? Yeah, which is pretty good. And it's more my brothers. They get they get annoyed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my brother, my smaller, my youngest brother, Nick, he uh, goes to, went to the same school as me, or is now going to the same, and he's 16, so... He gets a bit of flack from his mates, I think. Because so. <laughs> you're one of three brothers? Yeah, I'm the eldest of three, yeah. Eldest of three, yeah. How do you find that relationship kind of as a family, but then with you being a pro rugby player, obviously they both play rugby mm-hmm. as well. Is there an interesting dynamic or is it just the same as same as? Brothers? Oh, it's the same, yeah. I mean, Tom, the middle one, he's over in Australia right now. Mm-hmm. He's playing for the Reds. Um, hopefully he gets some game time this year and uh, it'd be pretty cool to one day maybe... Uh, Say I'm playing for England, he plays for Australia. Uh, it'd be cool to play against him. <laughs> him sending spiral bombs up and I have to catch them. But um, no, it's like you said, I don't think it's ever been a weird dynamic. It's always just been, we all play rugby, we all love it and we all want each other to succeed really. And I remember when we won uh, the final in 2021, they were all there. It was just before Tom was going out to Australia. Oh, nice. um, and I'd never seen them like cry out of happiness before and I don't think they're fully crying but I saw like each of them had a bit of a tear in their eye and when we hugged so it's uh it was a pretty cool moment for me and my family when that happened that's awesome um so who's the best then out of the three <laughs> I get down to the yeah that's what, that's, that's, that's what we want to know who's, who's, the, who's uh, the best all very different oh, yeah. I'd say I mean I'm a I'm a back three player Tom's a t- uh, like a right now he's quite a small 10 right, but yeah. very 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 good kicker of the yeah. ball um really nice footballer and then Nick he's I think he'll be the best one because he's a bit of both he's a good footballer he can kick off both feet pass but then he's also tall he's quick he's agile and he's uh so I think he'd make a good fullback that's okay. yeah so hopefully he doesn't come in and take my position a few years <laughs> that would be a bit embarrassing but um yeah no okay nice well that's uh we've, we've got the family politics um out out the way and then was it always rugby? Because it kind of feels like, even just talking to you then, mm-hmm. mentioned Queen's Academy at 13, you were like, oh, I was playing at 4-5 or five at, at Richmond. Mm-hmm. Was there ever anything else that even thought you, or you thought you might be looking at as a career, as a um, life? Was it always life in rugby? I never, I never really thought I'd go into a career into anything else. I, I mm. didn't know about, I didn't think I'd become a professional rugby player until I was 14, 15. Yeah. But I... We were a very sporty family. We played a lot of sports when we grew up. So, yeah, I started playing rugby when I was four, but uh, there was football, cricket, tennis, um, swimming. You know, like, we did tons of stuff, and we all really loved it. I I probably liked rugby the most when we were all younger because I was a bit bigger than my brothers, and they, my brothers, when they played, would get affected, not beaten up, but, like, there would be kids bigger than them, and they, did, yeah. they enjoyed football more. 
right. but now they then they grew up and they've learned oh rugby's actually really fun they were good as well so can i just say we're going to clip that bit up there they enjoyed football more and then they grew up and realized it was all about <laughs> rugby so uh yeah, everyone grow up it's football's a <laughs> kids game <laughs> um, yeah no it's uh it's good it's we we really enjoyed uh all sports growing yeah. up i think i think and i think that helped all of us become good rugby well hopefully nick is a good rugby player when he gets up or becomes professional but i think micro skills like um cricket uh cricket mm -hmm. reactions and um learning how to catch a small ball with one hand two hands it really helps with your catching or um football for kick striking a ball well especially for tom he's a 10 he's i think when you watch him kick he's it, he looks like a footballer when he kicks um the way he kicks the ball so it's it's um no i think yeah, credit to my parents they were never really pushy they were never like right play rugby only they were yeah. like if you want to play bloody tennis yeah for and go for it that will you'll you'll have our full support but they were no they were never like you can't do that they were always like yeah, yeah we'll take i mean i i even played chess uh i went to chess tournaments when i was like eight years old and my dad spent his sun, uh, Sunday afternoons taking me to a few chess tournaments. And he was like, yeah, I don't know what I was doing, but uh, you wanted to do it. So. That's amazing. I, I mean, know, yeah. brilliant for you to have that that support to kind of feel mm -hmm. able to make those choices. But talk me through chess then. I mean, <laughs> yeah. because... <clears throat> I'm, people... not, I'm not good at it anymore. I don't ask uh, okay. to play. You, you were a child prodigy. I was a child left. and then I gave up for rugby. <laughs> yeah, that's it. No, um, no, I just, I just, all of us played... All, all three brothers also did chess at, um, at a younger level, and we we because we used to have one at home, and we'd always play against each other or against dad, and yeah. dad would be like, I'll, I'll beat you, and then we, it slowly got to a point where we were all beating him. So, but Nick's probably the best at it. He's he was he was actually really good at it. Um, but for some reason, I did a chess tournament. I don't know why. I don't <laughs> think I did very well. So. And then, but do you find that you say you didn't do very well? Like if you're playing in a tournament, you're probably doing all right. Yeah. But like playing against your brothers, is there a tactical element in chess in terms of that <laughs> strategy problem solving that you take into rugby or am I reaching here? You know, you're reaching a bit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, I think it was just another sort of, because we're also very competitive people, I think it was just another sport, if you can call it that, um, where we could play against each other. And it's the same as video games. The reason I started playing video games was because we played against each other. And yeah it was whoever was better would win and get all the bragging rights and it got it got messy sometimes jesus uh, there was some fifa games where there were heads lost oh uh, there's a uh, controllers thrown and... um, people punching yeah it's, wow i know i remember i, <laughs> I don't know uh i yeah, know go on no you've was, said it now there was i beat uh tom on fifa once and he uh <laughs> he, <laughs> i was celebrating in front of him he got so this was when we were way younger i think it was like fifa 10 or something on the wii um <laughs> um and it, he got so angry he kicked me up the ass and i i bruised my coccyx <laughs> i couldn't walk for like two days <laughs> yeah it was so bad it was no it was really it was yeah i, I can't believe i still remember that yeah. um, it's horrifying i'm traumatized actually Traum so traumatized it sounds I like need it. therapy yeah, yeah sorry for making you sit down for this record <laughs> um <laughs> that sort of sibling rivalry but do you think that's why you're all kind of pursuing sporting careers that competitive nature mm -hmm. that kind of you go well if he's doing it i want to be better than him and in a hopefully healthy way beyond yeah, the beyond yeah. the kicking i don't think i don't yeah i don't think there's ever now that we've grown up i don't think there's a real element of i want to be the best i'm gonna mm. i'm playing it just because i don't want my brother to be better than me i think it's just we're all very competitive and it all led us to being highly skilled in a sport in a sport i think and um also we're lucky we're we have some element of natural talent to get to that level as well but i think the f the amount of competitiveness we have drove us to work on it when we, no one was lo like i remember in our old house there would be like a park behind it mm. um and me and my brother nick was too young at this point but me and tom used to go out um outside and there'd be this tree and we're about right that tree is the goal post and you just envision goal post and we'd do kicking through there and there'd be we'd set up a rugby pitch and do stuff and that was when we were god eight years old to about 16 until he moved to boarding school so it's um wow. yeah stuff like that i think it's just uh, it wasn't the fact that we were you see all these movies like um people parents driving their kids to insanity forcing them to go out and play rugby and practice yeah, their yeah. kicking we just did it because we loved it and uh 
we loved uh, playing against each other, with each other. And yeah, my <laughs> there used to be uh, indoor rugby competitions at our house uh, when we were younger. It would be me versus my other two brothers. I'd be on my knees on the stone floor. A few bits of crying from them, uh, yeah. uh, especially Nick. He was young. <laughs> he, was, he was getting dump tackled by me and I was about triple his size so you know <laughs> up to the stone floor so I think I made him the man he is now so. yeah sure I think what, what is coming out of this is we're all rooting for Nick to take Be your place the on the team mate. That's, um, <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what's happening yeah, now no, they play this in a five years time when he's in the <laughs> He's in the first team. <laughs> um, I think we need to get we need to get both brothers on for a right of reply. Yeah. Um, so okay, so then you're, you're playing rugby. You you guys are just playing rugby with each other, sport with each other all the time, and that's just part of who you are. Mm-hmm. And then, how do Quinns kind of fit into that? Then, what well, age age thirteen? Mm-hmm. Because obviously, your dad has a connection to another London rugby team. Yeah. Like obviously, there's the location, but but how did that evolve for you? Yeah. So um, you know, it was more the location element. We've mm-hmm. lived in. Uh, Southwest London our whole life. We lived in Richmond, Twickenham, sort of area since we moved from Italy. Um, and it was more, I went to the primary school King's House in Richmond mm-hmm. and they had a connection or sort of like a location element to Quinn's and there were the trials um, and I got in, into them and uh, that's it's how it's been ever since. Uh, 14, 15, I got to say, I love, if you ask it, a lot of the guys who are in my year, they were they were always like, "Yeah, you were never here. You're always just in Italy <laughs> on holiday." <laughs> I, I remember Lennox. If you ever asked him, I remember Lennox when I came to a summer training uh, one day when I think we were sixteen. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I uh, I arrived and my dad was watching by the side of the pitch and he was just like, "What the hell is Michael Liner doing here?" <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, that's my dad. Uh, <laughs> nice to meet you guys." <laughs> that was the first time I'd ever met Lennox and now um yeah, we're still really good mates now and we're in the first team together. So it's pretty cool to That's cool have to be on that on that journey, but also do you kind of reflect and think that was ever daunting for them that Michael Lyon has turned up and watched some mm. academy rugby or when they realised it was your dad, they were like, oh, fine. No, no, I think that's... that. I, I hope they don't didn't feel like that, that they needed to impress him or in any way. That's why I think he, he wants to stay out of the way as much as possible because he doesn't want, I don't know, people, to, well, people noticing him or players to get distracted or worrying about s- s- silly stuff like that. Yeah. Like, um, And, like, I'm, he never did that to me. Like, he never was like, you've got to really impress here he was more like just go and have fun and just play and and that's what I do now it's like the more you think about uh, I got last year especially I was a bit of a before my injury that's what I struggled with a lot I um got fast I got put into the England squad Mm -hmm. for a lot of training camps I we won the premiership and I was kind of having this spotlight a lot by coaches and uh, fans and etc etc no no one ever really said that to me but I felt that, and yeah. when there was a few games, um, because obviously Tabs uh, Tabai coming in as the new head coach, obviously there's an element of you wanting to mm. impress and want to be um, first choice on the team sheet, and I think that played a bit in my head as well. And there were games where I'd make a mistake, and it just wouldn't leave my head, and it would yeah. just compound. And uh, there was some games after the game, I was just I did some good stuff, but I just feel completely like. I'd feel really emotional because I'd be, I wouldn't, I was like, I haven't played well here. I, uh, I've done this and that. And it, it, I mean, I was 21, 2021, 20, like I'd never really dealt with that. And it was, it was more the fact that there were more factors into play. That was England, obviously, and uh, wanting to keep my position in the Harlequin squad as well. And yeah, it was tough, but I think hopefully I've overcome that now. <laughs> I'm just going to go out there and, Play my game when I when I next get the chance. Well, that's an interesting bit of of self awareness for you looking back now. Do you think having we'll come on to the injury stuff in a minute? Mm. But do you think having that enforced time away from the game mm. has given you the chance to put what was let's face it that twenty twenty one twenty two what a mad period in your mm. life put that into a bit of perspective of go I was twenty one and yeah I was winning prems and getting into England squads and mm. suddenly it was it was all super heightened and having that time away has allowed you to reflect on. What maybe you weren't doing that was healthy. At, yeah, at yeah. I think I think this time off, almost a ble- I don't like saying it, but a blessing in disguise because obviously I've started my uni degree and yeah. I was going to start it regardless of my injury. Right. And I've now thinking, 
this would have been a lot harder if I was playing week in, week out and having to do uni rug, um, uni work as well. But also, yeah, I think I feel my, myself, I feel like I'm a better player and a better person already and I haven't even played yet. So I hopefully that translates to on translates on the pitch. But mentally, I feel like I, I'm, it's almost like the next chapter in my book uh, in my book it's uh it's like uh i i've gotten past all this expectation and worry and kind of just being like look just go out there and play rugby and do loads of great stuff and everything else will take care of itself so and what was there a turning point for someone that you, you someone that you spoke to or someone that you've kind of com- give credit to to helping you transform that that way of looking at things and being able to park that worry or is that something your journey went on by yourself uh, i think the both both elements i think there's a lot of reflection by myself i think just watching lots of rugby when i've been injured i've been like yeah i was 21 mm. but there's watching games it's almost more frustrating than actually playing because i see so much stuff i'm like oh god do this or yeah. I, I see things that like I just do naturally when I'm on the field and it's frustrating, but also like uh, credit um, coaches like Snap, um, Nick Evans, uh, Tabai, um, Eddie Jones, um, my dad, they all really helped me. Um, sorry. <coughs> um, they, it was, yeah, it was a bit like, like I was saying, it was pretty tough for me, but um, yeah. they kind of just put everything into perspective for me. It was like, you're 20, 21 in an England squad on the verge of potentially getting a cap if you train well or keep playing well. Um, that's amazing. Like, yeah. you, there's no need for you to worry. And and for one that stuck out with me, I think my dad always said in, Eddie said in tabs, um, they were like, the reason you're here is because you're good enough. Yeah. Like, you shouldn't... The more you worry, the more mistakes that you wouldn't usually... That's what frustrated me the most when I was playing is I make mistakes that I never used to make. I, yeah. I, I, I'd drop a high ball twice in a row. I never used to drop high balls or I would um, spill the ball or something yeah. like that. I just never usually do that. And that's what frustrated me the most. And I think they could see that. And I think having this almost reset to my career, it's almost been like I'm starting fresh. It's, um, it's pretty cool. And I hope I can just come back with a bang and go from there. Well, exciting, mm. I think, to, to hear that, but also, I think, really impressive because, you know, you said you were a 21 year You're still a young guy mm. and still kind of on this, at the start of this journey, mm-hmm. to be able to have that time to step back, reflect and understand that the work that you're doing is what's got you where you are mm-hmm. and that one or two mistakes doesn't change mm-hmm. that. Um, so then coming back to, to, your, to your academy time, mm-hmm. At what point did you realise or start to think, actually, I'm going to make it here? Is there a moment for you when you're when you're playing or you're training and you're with other guys, you go, actually, I can do this mm-hmm. and I'm going to do it here? Um, I don't know. There wasn't really a moment. I guess <clears throat> uh, being in the England age group stuff, that mm-hmm. helps. But um, I think it was just several guys like me sam um sam riley lennox we would do stuff on the pitch that you don't see other 17 18 year olds do it was very different even when we're playing for the academy league we'd all we'd do stuff and other teams players would do stuff who came through you they'd be like yeah he's he's a bit different to the rest he sees he sees things differently or he's superhumanly strong or he's always he's he can part he can kick so well and and it's stuff like that and it's um there was never really a time where people were like you're going to be professional it was just like it just happened yeah my friend my friends joked about it at school like oh you you don't need uni you're going pro and i'd be like no like i never really got ahead of myself Mm -hmm. like uh, if i didn't play well for academy there was uh, yeah i might have got a contract but like it wouldn't have done any good for me. Yeah. I mean, playing really well and setting yourself up, it's just like, you never know who might be watching games you play. Yeah. Even if, <clears throat> uh, even if it's, I don't know, Hampton versus Tiffin. Yeah. Or, or it's Harlequins versus Saracens in the Academy League final, for example. Yeah. Um, 
anyone can be watching at any time. And if you, if you, that, you have to show your the best of yourself every single time. So that's that's, so, that's how I go about it. I think if you apply yourself to the best of your ability every single time, you give your hundred and ten percent every time, no matter what you're doing, then people will see that. The people who matter will see the unseen. I stuff think that, that's the that's the interesting bit you just added there. The people that the people that matter. Mm. Um, and do you think in that period that you discussed where you know, maybe you were getting more and more frustrated with that worry, that anxiety was was kind of creeping in around it? that you were devoting too much time to the voices of people that didn't matter, maybe? Or... Uh, almost almost the other way around. Really? I think because I never, yeah, the like having, I love the fans and having people being like, you are amazing all the time. It's like, I, I love that, but I also, I don't use that as my main bit of feedback almost. Got you, yeah. Because, so that's what I'm saying. It's almost the other way around because the games that I would feel I didn't play well, people would tell me I played really well in. And I'd be like, ah, no, I didn't. I made this I made this error. He, Eddie Jones definitely saw this and he won't be happy with that. Or Tab saw this and we talked about it the other week and he wouldn't be happy with that. So that's inside my brain, basically. And that's interesting. That's, it's though. crazy. I'm not sure if all professionals feel like that, but me, because I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And mm. like I said, I struggled a bit with my head last year. It's... um that's what the inside of my head looked like. It wouldn't be like, oh, I'm worried what the thousands of fans would think. I'm more worried about that one person. Yeah. That, and, and that hearing, his opinion. And hearing somebody mm. say, you were amazing, you were brilliant. That it's, would, it's great. It's, it's lovely, it, but that wouldn't have helped in that it, situation. It, yeah, it would be. It's great to hear so many people being like, you were great. And it, it does help you a bit. Mm. But then in the back of my mind, I'm like, but I did... Yeah, but you don't know about I'm, that bit. Yeah, you yeah. don't know I did this glaring error that no one, no fans really see, but coaches pick up on instantly. Right, okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, and then, okay, so that evolution to a professional player just felt like the right path yeah. for you. Mm. It was, there wasn't a moment where you went, oh, I've done it. You were like, well, I'm just playing my rugby. No, and no, then exactly. This has that's, happened, this that's has happened. what, especially what my dad told me is when I made England under 16s, mm. he, I think he gave me a stat being like, this is great, but... 80%, I don't know, 80 percent of p kids who get to this level don't go professional because they think it's the 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 king of all things they think they've achieved they, they've their... achieved the top of the top whereas it's a stepping stone it's like a platform you can show yourself yeah he made under 16 england's he's the best under 16 fullback in the in the country right now whoa like it's cool but yeah. you've got to keep playing well because if you yeah imagine if you play well in that under 16 game but then you go into that under-17 league, which is when you start playing under-18s as yeah. well as other 17-year-olds. You play there and you play terribly for three or four games. Yeah. They, 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 they might drop you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they, you might not get... Even if you're playing well for school, that might not matter. And it's that's why you've got to keep going. And, like, even um, here, it's um, getting into the first team. Yeah, it's cool, but then I want to play 50 times for the first team or 100 yeah. times and... I want to be a starter no matter what the condition, the people who are playing, I want to be the first person down in that back three spot mm -hmm. along with others like Marcus, Domers, Caden. They're all, when you hear them, you're like, yeah, they're, they're a shoe yeah, in for most teams. Yeah. Um, then obviously the next stepping stone for me, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> is getting back in to the squad after this injury. Yeah. And then we'll see where we go from there after play some rugby first you know well we're excited to, <coughs> to we're excited to see you back out there um doing your thing play, playing rugby again but i think also like it's a huge asset to a team when you've got an individual with that mindset mm. right and i think i don't know how you would f describe whether that's a shared mindset with a with a lot of the players at mm. quins that you're all pushing it certainly sounds like that helped for you when you were in the academy with guys like Lennox, mm. Sam Riley that, that have also made that step across. Mm. But do you find that's the same environment here at the club now for you that everyone's got that same drive? Yeah, I, I think um, it's. I think they do when we're all here, when we're all mm. at the club and we're playing, everyone's dedicated to that one thing, it's winning. Yeah. But I know that there might not be, there's a, I don't know, there's only like, it's just the way people are. There's only a select few people 
who would go home and then just watch rugby again. Right. And just like, it's almost like, not to sound like weird about it, but like almost dedicate their life to their job almost. And like, I wouldn't, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm obsessed with it, but like I, I went on the weekends. I don't watch football too often unless Arsenal's playing, obviously. Um, I like watching cricket, but if rugby's on, I watch all the rugby with my dad uh, all afternoon, basically. And like the Six Nations, watch all the Six Nations uh, without fail. Um, if the pre say the Prem rugby this weekend, <laughs> Friday night we've got Gloucester, and then I'll watch the other games as well. If I don't catch them live, I'll watch the highlights or something like that. So it's it's. Um, I know it's it's just a weird thing. It's uh, and, and when it's, you're and when you're watching rugby, mm -hmm. I guess you're watching it through a different lens than I would watch mm -hmm. it, right? You, I'm not. I'm watching my team or to see you know have Quinns won. Okay, how do these results affect where Quinns sit in the yeah, league? Yeah. What are you watching when you watch? Oh, the games? just I do watch just for a bit. Hopefully, some entertainment because after mm -hmm. all, that's what sports about. You want to actually be entertained when you watch someone play, um, but watching it might be an opposition that are in the running for top four so we might meet them in the playoffs or I just want to see how certain teams play if it's a good if it's a good matchup say uh I don't know uh, say Bath Northampton or Saris versus Sale that them those matches they'll be really interesting to watch because it's they're there's good players on each side yeah. they've both they've all got good sort of um, tactics about how they go about playing um, and it's cool to watch it I, I, usually, I don't like sit there with a note and pad, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, pen and paper and write down notes but I kind of just watch and I can see things like he should have pulled it then or what's the ref doing <laughs> um, or like just opportunities and then watching people's moves it's uh, and you try and when if I'm watching with my brother or my or my dad you try and call out call what they're going to do before they do it and see if you're right about it and, and getting better at it which is cool and uh, do you think that that's something that <coughs> do you think that's something that you'll take into your game on the pitch right that having watched a lot of these guys watching them play rugby one I imagine it's very frustrating when you can't get out yeah. and play when you're <laughs> injured um but now you're you're close to making that comeback You've got that body, I guess, of research almost that you've been doing. Well, it's it's, it's subconscious as well. Mm. It's um, the coaches do so much an, an analysis for us before yeah. games. So we'll get all what they do before the games, what their attacking plays are, what they do off scrums, lineouts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we have that all in front of us. But I think watching them out of rugby, you do. I think it just helps your subconscious to think, right? We're in this situation. It's, it's so hard to explain because it's a, yeah. it's like almost like a natural thing. Like I was saying, it's like an instinct mm. that you can almost pick up the sm like millimeters of, of a change in an elbow, yeah. which means the guy might pull it instead of hitting the front door or it's, yeah. um, yeah, it's small things like that. And it's, and it's, yeah, it's a game. Um, rugby is, if you make the wrong decision, even if it's a split second, you'll, it will cost you. So it's uh, it's about putting yourself in the best position, uh, both mentally and physically, to be able to make the correct decision. And I think watching a lot of rugby helps you with that. But it's like with it's interesting to hear you talk <coughs> about it. It's interesting to hear you talk about it in that way that it's research, mm -hmm. right? That you're kind of it's not. You're not playing the game and go, oh, I remember three months ago I watched him do this, this we might no, do it no, here. Yeah, exactly. But the more you watch, the more likely you're able to oh, spot yeah. a subtle change in someone's body and go, yeah. okay, I know where I need to stand defensively yeah. here. I know where he's going to kick the or ball. Or you can, you, can, you can look at the nine. Uh, you can, whilst watching a team, you can see if the nine looks over a lot to see if there's kicking space. Or you can see the way, yeah. uh, what a uh, 10 signals if he's going to do a crossfield kick or a bomb. Um, for off 10 yeah. you'll see how people line up as well for it or um, like if the 10 wants to do a little dink over the line you'll see the 12 and 13 are slowly creeping up flatter so it's like it's um it's it's cool because I never really think about it too much because then I get caught up like that's yeah, that's that's yeah. what that's what it is it's um that's another thing last year that I found that I needed to do was just make the decision don't be like, well, he could pull it here or he could run himself. Because then the moment of hesitation, even if it's for half a second, it's, it's gone. So it's, you've got to 
just make your decision, even if it's right or wrong, 100% commit and it'll fix itself if it's wrong. If it goes right, you've nailed it because you're 100% committed to the decision. Interesting. Yeah, so once you make that decision, commit just 100%. Do it. Yeah. No, even if you're, if you're attacking and you decide to kick it, 100% just put everything into the kick. Don't think, oh, am I going to chip it or am I going to hit it long? Just do something and commit to it because that's a, that's that would be my advice to anyone really is just like if you're going to do an action in rugby don't go about it half half assed almost just go for it and would you say that you'd extend that advice to even outside of rugby to mm. someone if they're going to do something like with you your economics degree mm. or yeah if you rehab do it yeah yeah or well, exactly because they're the only if you're if you're not giving yourself with my rehab if you're not giving 110 percent every day every single session uh, the way i think it, it's almost karma in a way like oh you you really slacked off that week so i'm so karma's gonna come back in another way almost like it's gonna you're gonna i don't know fail your uni exam or something like that because you didn't do that it's it's probably not that healthy <laughs> thinking about it but um that's yeah if i'm gonna do three hours of uni stuff i'm headphones in nothing else just do the uni work and it gets done and that's and then you feel good about it or the rehab it's been a long eight months yeah mm. and it's been some dark days but the the harder you work the better it will feel once you're back because all the work you know the amount of work you're almost overworked than what you needed to do right and okay. then you know you're 100% know that you're in your mind you know I'm fine See, it's interesting because you were quick to say, oh, that might not be that healthy. But I think what's <laughs> fascinating about it is that that's a real insight into you as a person and a personality. And one, why you are sat here as a Harlequin, as a premiership winner, um, being called up and around international squads. But also why you're on the comeback trail from this injury, getting ready to get back into the team at the level that you're at, because that's how you process it. Now, I'm sure many people are listening to this and thinking, wow. That's pretty intense. Yeah, so, I've been told that. A lot. Yeah. <laughs> so, is there? Do you find that that intensity is important for you in all aspects of life, or are there certain things that you do with a different level of intensity, where it maybe it is a bit more relaxed, it is a bit yeah. more social? Or... So, I, yeah, I do relax sometimes. I do relax sometimes. sometimes. That's yeah, the get that in the quote. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's like. Uh, friends will joke that even when i'm gaming i'm like getting really <laughs> like loud about it or no i do relax i like when i do watch sports sometimes i just like i say i'm analyzing but i literally all i'm doing is just lying on the sofa watching i'm not really yeah. getting animated about it or um now you mentioned arsenal and <laughs> and i feel i get animated about that yeah, yeah. Uh, no i don't want to go on a tangent because this could be a whole separate podcast but uh, what i want to ask if, is yeah, hopefully we've won the prem by now <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't put it out there Lewis. don't put it out there. um <laughs> but what i want to ask is that when you're watching that sport right when mm. you're watching football and that's a team that you that you support mm. Do is you find different? yeah? Is it different? Do you you watching with the same analytical eye, or is that your? No, you turn I, it into I just more I just I just literally turn it on because I want to see if they win. It's a bit like um, what you were saying with Quins. You mm. might check your phone. Our oh, Quins have won. That's good. Yeah, but with I'm not going to watch football being like, oh, they're not playing the diamonds. They're not. They're not doing tiki taka. That I, I don't really know enough to be like. But that. do you find that that's helpful because actually you can yeah, watch I can it just as relax. a fan. Yeah, or yeah, it's stressful as well and. Like if they lose to Ch my brother supports Chelsea, and if he if Chelsea beat Arsenal, I'm I'm hearing about it for the next <laughs> several months. Yeah. Like they're currently tenth, so it's fine. Yeah, don't <laughs> do it. All, all stats correct at time of recording. Yes, so yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, it's uh no, and no, it is something different. Like watching, cri uh, I mean, cricket. It's a bit different because there's a bit of interest there with the Ashes, but mm. um. um no, I think football, it's just a fun thing to be able to do. I don't take it too seriously. And I'm not like a diehard like supporter or anything. I, I'll say that myself, but I do support Arsenal. I love seeing them do so well after years of misery. It's been so depressing. <laughs> um, but hopefully, touch wood, this year will be the year that we do something good. Hopefully, at least get back into the Champions League. That's all I want. Very well said. Well, we'll leave yeah. that there because we run the risk of um, <laughs> boring everyone for a yes. further two yeah. or three hours. Um, 
So you've mentioned a lot already about the positive influence of, of coaches, of, of your dad, uh, Eddie Jones was someone you mentioned, and you talked about England age-grade rugby. And now for many years, and I mentioned it in the introduction, right? you're eligible through residency mm-hmm. for England, obviously through your, your dad for Australia and through your mum for Italy. For yeah. Italy. There was probably lots of column inches devoted to where you would end up playing your international rugby <laughs> around is, that period yeah, yeah. that you, you know, we won the premier, premiership. Was there ever a debate in the house is what I want to know. Was it ever dad's there with his, you know, full with, 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 his, with his full wallabies tracksuit, um, mum's there in, in the blue of Italy and you're there going, oh, I don't know. And my friends, uh, my friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But how does, that, um, how does that play out? No, it's, a, a unique it's, a, it's, situation. A cool, it's a cool situation to be in. I'm very lucky to be able to say I've got not only like I've got three countries that mm. I could potentially play for if I'm obviously good enough. Um, and yeah, it was, there was a debate at one mm. stage because at one stage I thought I was going to go to Australia and play over there. And mm. then I re-signed here, which was really good. So this was two and a half years ago. Right. Um, and obviously I can still play for Australia, mm. but it's a lot harder being here with Harlequins, et cetera, et cetera. Right. But um, there was, there was some debates. We, mold it over a lot and Italy was another decision but I just I would love to play there but if I think I, I don't know if I think I can say this but um, um, I talked to the Italian head coach um, at the time and he was like I don't blame you if you have the options of Australia or England I wouldn't blame you if you wanted to pursue, the, pursue those options first mm. which is really nice of him to say so <clears throat> that, that's what I'm currently doing hopefully I can get back and get back to the levels, if not better than what I was, and get back into contention for things. Um, but um, England, Australia is a very big debate. Um, I think dad, dad has never been really, you've got to play for Australia. Like you, you would be doing a disservice to the family. Uh, that would be horrifying. <laughs> he's, he's not gone full godfather. No, right? no, you know, no. Like, right. Yeah, you're getting disowned if you play for England. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's, um, I think he was just like, look, we will support you no matter what. Mm. Just do what you think is the best for you. And um, for right now, England is the best for me right now. And he agrees it would be silly for me to put Quinns into jeopardy um, because I choose to play for Australia. Then it just all gets really complicated. Right. So right now, England is the best option. But who knows? Uh, I might not be in contention for them. And... Um, uh, it will just have to see. I have to come back to playing and um, hopefully play really well and get back into the Quinn squad and then we'll see. Well, I think it's interesting to hear you talk about that, right? Because there's so many competing factors in there. And mm. I think the, the line that probably everyone would love is, oh, I have to play for Australia because my dad said, or I play for England because this is my country. And, and you're like, yeah. no, there's practical decisions that yeah. need to be made here it's about important. your yeah, yeah. career. Yeah, because it's, it, can, it affects it. A decision like that really impacts the future trajectory of my career. Mm. Because say, I, theoretically, I chose to play for Australia, mm. I'd most likely have to move over there yeah. because it would make the most sense, and it may it would mean I could get the full, full I don't know, uh, for the most out of it. Yes, because I feel yeah. like I'd be doing myself a disservice if I yeah I chose to play for Australia, but I'm still playing here and living here. Yeah, you it just wouldn't it wouldn't work in, in either camp. Whereas I'm living here. And if I'm lucky enough to be selected for England, it would be stupid for me to turn it down because they're, um, they're a great team. All my friends are here. Um, there's new coach, Steve, who, who I hear uh, from what people have been saying and from what I've been seeing, is it, it looks amazing in the camp. And um, it'd be great to be a part of that. But um, first, as, as, I, as I always want to bring back to, is that I've got, I've got to actually play some rugby first and... Hopefully, I'm back better than I was before. And I think that's a a great way to look at it, and probably <coughs> right, to, to a great place to leave that that part of this conversation mm. is that ultimately you've got to be good enough to get picked. And mm. then, what a great problem to have if you've got three oh, exactly. countries banging your door down. But the reality is, is that you've I might got to not play well enough. Uh, yeah, I've got. It won't matter unless I play well for Quins. And right now, I'm not playing for Quins because I've been injured. So I've got to get back to playing for Quins and play well so it's um that's exactly it it's uh, it won't be an issue for me yeah. if i'm not playing well because then there's no point in even thinking about that i remember i think it was um 
uh, when it was COVID time and we did that talk with yes. my dad, you and myself and you were, it was just basically the same thing. And I, I, I remember saying it's, there's what dad used to always say is that there's no point in thinking about future line selections or world cups with England, or Australia or Italy, if I'm not playing well or week in week out with Quinns. And so it's like, like I was saying, it's one step at a time, never get too far ahead of yourself. So sort of stuff. Well, and then let's go back to, to that's interesting one you bring up because yeah that was during the period of lockdown and everyone got to see the inside of my living room for, for most <laughs> most most quins events that was, that was um, interesting, which is yeah. uh which is a mad period of time but then you think what then came after that was that big explosion for you right was quins winning the prem with you right at the heart of it i mean scoring those two tries at twickenham yeah. i don't mind saying that i celebrated far too hard at the first try <laughs> and then exeter came back into the game and i thought i've gone way too early yeah, okay. here yeah um but what was that well, like you said, you know, you, your brothers were emotional. The whole family were there. Was that even in your thoughts at the start of that season, middle of that season, that that was mm. even an option for that year? Well, let alone yeah, well, exactly. Career? So when I came in to play, um, it was uh, Paul Gustard was still um, head coach, and um, I got given the opportunity, and I, I'd like to say I took it effectively, and I got a few games under my belt. I think I played about ten mm. around that time. Um, and then I got a groin injury. It wasn't like a sudden, I tore my groin. It was like this weird build up of, um, because I was still young yeah. and we hadn't worked on say my core, like got, and that suddenly I was getting exposed to loads of rugby, yeah. a lot of high intense running and it, my body just couldn't keep up. So it's, I think it was like two or three months getting my groins right. And then I came back mm -hmm. in right at the end of the season, mm -hmm. uh, played sail away, which is God, that was a battering. That was hard. <laughs> that was really hard to take. Um, came off the bench there, then started Newcastle, last game of the se uh, regular season here at the Stoop. Yeah. Um, and then played, got lucky enough to be picked for Brist, uh, Briston Ball. Um, yeah. <laughs> like to always mention that. Um, that obviously happened. And then uh, lucky enough to get picked to start in the final. And yeah. It happened. What what happened happened, and it was pretty. It was like I said, it was like a whirlwind of stuff. And then T Tab, I got appointed our head coach. A new season started. Um, uh, first game we won against Newcastle, and then I got a call from Eddie after that game, being like, I "Want you to come to this camp?" I was like, "Jesus, okay." Wow. <laughs> so like, it's it all happened. Like the, it went like it went up like that. Then it went down with the injury, and then it just suddenly went like that. Just exploded. And, and I was just like. like and it was hard, like I, we said before, it yeah. was hard to keep up. Um, so I think this injury is almost a blessing in disguise to be like, look, you are really good at rugby and you're good enough to be where you were, yeah. but just get out of your head and you could be even better. Yeah, sort of and thing. I think give you that, sounds like it's given you that perspective to be able to say... Yeah, like almost unlock the door for me and like to yeah. be like, just play rugby. It's in the end of the day, it's just a sport and... I, we're lucky enough to say that we do it as our job and I love doing it. And like, uh, that's it. Um, you're doing something that you love doing and you always, I'll hopefully always land on my feet no matter what. And as long as I keep playing, keep doing what I'm doing, I think um, I'll hopefully have a good career and um, get a lot of international opportunities. But just, yeah, I just want to have some fun playing. And Yeah, no, quite quite right. So you mentioned there that it's your, it's your job. And I think that's the interesting or an interesting angle to look at, and we want to look at on this on this podcast as well, mm. is that, yes, it's playing rugby, yes, it's it's a sport, but it's it's ultimately your your career. Yeah, it's about about it's, it's going to set, a, it's a big part of my life, isn't mm. it? It's uh, what what happens in this career will do a lot for my future. It's uh, If I have a really successful career, I play, I don't know, 70 odd times for England and a lot for Quinns and... Um, That'll set up my future pretty well, hopefully, uh, exactly, if yeah. I look after myself after rugby. But then, I don't know, uh, something could happen. Um, I don't have that career. And it's, it's, it's one of those things that's, that's professional sport. It can have really high highs, yeah. but incredibly low lows. And, mm -hmm. and it can, anything can happen in it. And like I said, yeah, I, I don't like saying it's my job, but like, it's, my, it's a passion I've had since I was four years old. And... I'm I'm incredibly lucky to be saying I'm playing sport as my job. I mean, so I, I think we don't give it enough credit. Yeah, no, for, no, for sure, <coughs> for sure.
For sure. And I think, OK, let's let's run the clock forward then. You've mm. played 70 times for England. You've had this glittering career. You've got your first in economics as well. <laughs> and, <laughs> and Lewis Liner, Chancellor of the Exchequer, comes oh, next, God, right? No. So you're in charge of the country's <laughs> no. finances. Oh, no, don't put me on this spot. Uh, <laughs> no, okay, what not, are you going to do to yeah, solve the country's Solve problem? the issues. No, uh, but, <laughs> but I think what people would want to know about their future Chancellor is, is are you a spender or a saver in your life? <sighs> oh, wow. It depends on what, I would say, but... Um, okay. Uh, oh, jeez. Give me some examples. Like, um, Okay, so are you someone who makes lots of impulse purchases or do you tend to, to save up, I don't know, like for a house, a car, clothes? Yeah, shoes? so uh, there's an element of, but, um, of me saving, yes. There's uh, investment sort of going, going down that route. I have investments and do sort of that stuff. Mm-hmm. But then I'm also, yeah, quite an impulsive person as well. I like going out for dinners. Yeah. Uh, I like watches. I like shoes. I... Um, yeah, Amazon's not good for that. They really know what they're doing over there. So shoes, um, are, you, are you someone big that, shoe that, person, that, yeah. that designer mm. shoes that wants the latest ones when they come out? Yeah, like I'm quite picky about them. Uh, I don't okay. just buy a pair of Jordans because they're Jordans. It's got to be specific, mm. really mm. nice pair of Jordans. And like the, the rarer mm. ones are obviously the harder ones to get. Mm. But if you manage to get them for retail price, you're in for a lot of money. So interesting. It's, it's, it's a big, it's a good, it's like the watch market. It's mm. as soon as that shoe is bought for retail, if you don't open the box and keep it for five years, some shoes go up by like two grand. Which is, is Which amazing. I, there was a shoe, there was a shoe that I've loved for years. Um, I remember looking back, I'd say five years when I was, uh, I think I was still in school. Um, the price of that shoe was like 500 pounds. I was like, oh, okay, that's decent. I might buy it one day because obviously I didn't have a salary back then. I yeah. looked the other day, uh, same pair of shoes now, two grand. Wow. New, new, like in the box, new. If someone kept it for that long, they would have made, they probably, the retail would have been like 200 pounds. Mm-hmm. They would have made a lot of money. That's fascinating, yeah. isn't it? And yeah. so, and that, is that something that you mentioned about your, your investment store? I'm not going to ask for your, for your portfolio. secrets. Portfolio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get the portfolio out now. I want to <laughs> investigate it. But at what point, because you're still a young guy, at what point mm. did you realise that was going to be an important part? Because as you've already said, right, rugby is this career, but there will be a next career yeah, well, and you'll a, have yeah, the rest you have of your life. You worry about something else. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. I think it was like my dad, like I was saying, when, my, when I was young, my dad was always a keen investor as well. Mm. And he, even when I was young, I was like, oh, what, what are you investing in? He probably lied to me, I don't know. But um, I don't think he wanted to tell his 15-year-old son what he was spending his money on. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, no, it's, uh, I think it's just a smart thing to do, to be honest. But mm-hmm. Because like, if you put five grand away in <clears throat> stocks that are going to appreciate over the years, in 20 years' time when I maybe have kids or something, that 5K has turned into 20K and... I can pay for one term of school, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but I think what's, what's interesting is, is you're talking about kind of the the, the growth of the investments. And obviously, mm. it's about long term, right? So, yeah. for example, it's no use using those shoes as the example, right? If you bought them and sold them the week after for an extra £150, then yeah. maybe that's good. Or for retail price, again, oh, you've exactly. got the same no point, that, That's what I was saying. There's no point in doing that, really, in my head. Yeah, if it's I'm about gonna, it. Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. And like, there is... I did do a bit of... Um, I, I have a friend who helps with my investments as well. He's like a genius economic <laughs> person as well. So it's uh, uh, it's useful having him because he, he that's what he wants to go into. He wants to go into mm. he does a lot of research and tells me what good good stocks do, and he helps me with that. Um, um, but there was I didn't really find, when all the cryptocurrency stuff was going mm. around and the Bitcoin and oh no, not Bitcoin, cryptocurrency is um, I. I didn't really mess around with that because I, yeah, you could, there were stories of people, yeah, I invested a hundred pounds and two days later I got 200 K from it. I'm like, that's great, but I don't want to invest a couple grand to lose it in 30 seconds, you know, and that's, and that's what we've now seen. Uh, I don't know if uh, you saw in the news, I'm sorry to be boring. Um, Recently there's been a huge uh, crypto crash and Mm. people have been losing their whole life savings and, because they put it all in that. And yeah, it's fine. I, I may have had 500 quid in there at one stage, but I won't put, I don't know, 200 grand in there yeah, and solely have that as my... It's about diversifying, oh, exactly, right? So exactly. you've got... Because there'll be peaks and troughs, things will go up mm-hmm. and down, but if you've got a 
big enough spread, then you're oh, exactly. protected. Then you're fine. You're protected. That's the stuff I was saying about like long-term investments. If you have something there that you can just always, if you needed money, that's always there. That's what I've got currently. If I if I ever somehow lost all my money that I had in my account, yeah. there would be that like safe that investment account that it's will, a safety that there. will have money in it for the next twenty or thirty years. Okay, and so we've talked a bit about kind of the you know the shoes thing there, but what what would you say your extravagances are? What are the things that you if you're mm. going to do it, you're like I'm going to do this well. Wow. Probably like going out for dinner and drinks. Yeah. yeah, that's my me and my girlfriend. That's our big thing. Um, we love going out for food and um, going to these cool places to have drinks as well. And I'm not doing it every day. I am professional. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not going <laughs> it's for been drinks. Been long eight months I'm, of rehab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm not. Yeah. I'm not drinking every day. That would be an issue. <laughs> um, no, it's when the odd celebration or yeah, yeah. the treat it's uh when we do decide to do it we like to go somewhere really nice and um i'd say um that's that's what i'm most maybe watches as well i um i really like watches as well and that's another thing that is a good investment as well in my opinion but um no yeah okay so Definitely the watch is for investment but but dining that's what that's you... just like sp- splash that's i love doing that yeah it's, it's, it. it's also like a almost getaway that's when i can relax like yeah, go and yeah, bring guess, it all yeah. back it's where i'm not intense <laughs> like, but you're in the know, moment as well right because you're oh, enjoying exactly, that experience exactly. with it's a different experience other than it's it's not just a boring go go to it for a meal it's like normally we try and do stuff that's cool or exciting, a really cool place or like a yeah. whole experience for the dinner. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. And, um, and it takes me away from rugby and it's like, I'm not worrying about sport or anything like that. It's, even if there was uh, a football game on or something like that, I just wouldn't even look at my phone. It's, no. it, it's just, it's just my, that my other side is just, it's much, that's when I can just switch off and relax. Okay. And then, could keep going for for hours and hours mm. of this um but i want to come on to my 